Um, I'll start just to um, to get the ball rolling. Um, instead of parading our very impressive uh, pedigrees and degrees, um, instead uh, we're going to each each of the six of us are going to say something about um, a research a journey through the material where it has helped us understand architecture in a better way. Um, and I, I first of all want to frame uh, these introductions by saying that um, these instructors are the best there are. Uh, Boston is uh, a, a point of gravitational pull for smart thinkers and architects, uh, in particular smart architects. And these instructors are really the best in the business. And when they customize the course, when they deviate from those eight topics that um, some of us are doing, when they do something different from what I'm doing, it's because they're obligated to do the best, to offer you the best they have to offer. And that requires them to customize the course and make it better than it would otherwise be. So I just want you to understand that uh, there is a general armature, a general framework that this course hangs on. And within that, these instructors are giving you something that is as good as this course has ever been or better. And uh, so it might be quite different. It might be a little bit different and might be very different than what your classmates are getting in the other courses. Um, so my journey recently has been informed um, by design experimentation with uh, bamboo. And I've been taking students to Bali and I've been learning, uh, uh, as a former builder myself, I've been learning new building techniques that are required by this material. And first and foremost, building techniques and secondarily, uh, design techniques. So the usual design build uh, phrasing really should be build design. And I've recently done a bit of research um, that I just finished two days ago and submitted uh, about the history of bamboo uh, throughout the world, but in particular in the tropics and how through colonial uh, oppression, bamboo was outlawed uh, by considerations of hygiene. And I realize now why it is so hard for people throughout the world uh, to accept bamboo as the miraculous building material that it is because it's got an association with poverty and uh, backwardness. And so the bamboo revolution that is otherwise sweeping the world uh, is being uh, handicapped and obstructed by the stigmas associated with material despite its miraculous performance and its inherent beauty. So that's my story. And Katrine, why don't you go next? Um, yes, thank you very much. And um, so I've, um, a few years ago, and I don't know if we have actually somebody on, on the call who's, who was involved, I don't think so. Um, I started thinking about um, the, what's going on in politics and um, the phenomena of fake news and since I'm not um, a very active person taking to the roads and to the streets, I was kind of thinking about how could I investigate this phenomenon of, of fake news in architecture. And I um, started looking at fake and real, and I've shared this with some, um, some of you already, and started inviting people to contribute. And um, a really um, fascinating collection of thoughts and processes that try to distinguish um, the reality of architecture, which is something you're going to work on from um, maybe imaginary notions um, came out of it. So lots of um, Wentworth faculty involved. The book came out actually yesterday um, that involves all these people and involves all these thoughts that relate to identity, um, belonging, um, reading architectural themes, interpreting them. And what turned out to be true is actually that there is no clear distinction between real and fake and like in so many things and that 
architecture has a lot more complexities, which is, I think, what you will discover when you make a very simple statement and start looking into the layering beyond that statement that things are a lot more complicated. So that's my recent um, set of discoveries and it was a wonderful collaboration. And if you're interested in the book, um, I have a lot of copies to send out, let me know. <laughs> How about you, Curtis? Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I think what you were saying, Robert, about the bamboo is something that um, I found in the work that I do. The firm that I'm at, we mainly do historic preservation, um, which is unfortunately often pursued by people in a sort of make the world great again mentality, as if there was some special past that needs to be retrieved to the exclusion of others. But, we find that um, often some inconsequential things are also very important. And you can take what is right in front of you and find all kinds of remarkable discoveries when you're patient with it and come at it with an optimistic point of view. So for me, this has played out recently just in my very own neighborhood. I live right down the street from the school in Roxbury and walking around the neighborhood, somebody asked me who knew what kind of work I do, if I would help them to save a church where a developer wanted to come in and tear down this particular building and put up a block of um, condominiums. And when I first looked at the building, it didn't seem very important. It was in a very dilapidated state. There was no longer any congregation. And it seemed very doubtful that there would be a rationale to keep this, but I started to look into it. And the more I looked, the more fascinating it became. There was, um, in fact, a very long history in this building that was originally built by Norwegians who came here as immigrants. And this was a church that they used to establish their community. So it became kind of a settlement center, helping people to find a job, helping them to find a home, and then as Roxbury changed with white flight in the 1950s, this became a new church. It was purchased by a group called the African Orthodox Church. So it became a black church. And in fact, it was one that was absolutely central to the civil rights movement, but this had gone generally unremarked. So I started a campaign to have that building landmarked and eventually we did prevail with the city, but on a really unusual basis because this building doesn't look interesting, but it had a kind of intangible, invisible element that made it worthy of being kept, even though it doesn't look like a monument. And I think this is such a central question these days as we're going through this real reevaluation of what monuments are important and what monuments mean. And what we're finding as we continue to work with this building and try to find a new use for it is not only is there a structure that we think of in the architectural sense with framing and all the other elements that put together a building, but there's a structure embedded in the building as well that is the history of our society, including things that we're not comfortable with. So there's a story of race embedded in this building. There's um, the story of disenfranchisement embedded here. And as we start to think about adapting the building we don't want to just come at it with our own ideas and impose something on it, but allow that to start to speak to us and see what it can suggest to us. So like with your bamboo, Robert, we look at this building and we ask it what it can suggest with the logics that are already embedded in it. And I think that that's the approach that I hope that um, we can explore together because our section this year is looking at um, building integration which sometimes is taken to mean very boring things like air conditioning systems and that type of thing. We can look at those as technical things, but I would tend to want to look at them more in the sense of how those themselves are systems within which we understand buildings. And we can change our mentality about what types of things are embodied in the built world that then begins to suggest us what kinds of worlds are possible. Because we're really at a moment where those are questions that need to be addressed. So look forward to meeting you guys. Jennifer. 
Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Gogler. I know some of you from my elective last year. It's good to see you again. Um, and I look forward to meeting others of you and um, working with you this semester. Um, I think what I say might resonate somewhat with what Curtis said, um, but in perhaps a little bit different context. Um, so you, some of you may know that I um, used to work in Rwanda uh, for a nonprofit uh, architecture firm. And that was a really interesting experience because I had to think about, um, you know, what, how do you design in a different culture, in a different place that's not the one that, you know, you're, um, you, that you grew up in or that you're used to? Um, and how do you respect sort of this other culture and this other, these other social norms and, and everything, um, and yet also provide, you know, your expertise in a meaningful way? Um, it's a really tricky balance and one that many of you might encounter because a lot of firms nowadays are doing more and more international work um, and you might find yourself working in um, a context that is less familiar to you. And I've always found that, you know, reading history and theory gives you sort of this perspective that I think is really critical to doing that kind of work. Um, whether it's, you know, Lawrence Vale, um, who I think we read in my elective, which you know, he talks about how do buildings express a national identity? What does that mean? Or Abdul Malik Simon talking about um, how people need to be valued as part of the sort of intangible infrastructure of a place. Um, all of these like things that I've read sort of have informed, I hope, <laughs> me being able to become um, sort of a more sensitive designer who um, is more respectful of uh, local culture when I'm working somewhere um, outside of the U.S. So um, I, I'm always, I've always been interested in that kind of uh, relationship between history and theory and what other people have studied and how I can learn from that in order to, um, to be a better designer in the context in which I'm working. Thanks. How about you, Linda? Well, I guess I... Uh feel very comfortable following Jennifer because I want to um, reinforce the fact that a number of us have uh, taught you in the past in a variety of uh, contexts, whether it's the history theory course or, or an elective. And I recognize a couple of names from uh, both history theory and also the adaptive interventions course that I've taught for a couple of years going and the interesting questions that come up in that course. And I, I want to um, emphasize the idea that really what's great about this course is that we explore questions and we don't necessarily look at answers as the important aspect of the, the course, but it's an exploration of, of questions that will lead you probably to places that you didn't anticipate. And I, um, I think that's the value of some of the readings, but it's also the value of what you bring to the course from your experience. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, opportunities that I've had in the last few years to travel a little bit in South and Southeast Asia and realize that uh, the orientation towards what is preserved or not preserved was an idea that was brought to that part of the world by a uh, Eurocentric vision. And now we're starting to question that. And that I think is the wonderful part of what you will explore this semester is questioning what the experts say. Is this guy really something presenting something I should believe or how can I question that? And that will lead you to an idea of uh, pursuing an idea for your thesis is how do I look at these experts and think critically about what they have presented so that I can, um, with good authority on my own, bring those questions to the work that I'm going to do in the next semester. I used to think um, that architecture was about buildings and I have come and, and I did a degree in urban design and I've come to realize that that's what I really see is that the buildings are only part of what we see around us that makes sense in how we navigate the world. 
I'm less interested in buildings as objects. I'm very interested in how buildings work with the context in which they are placed. So one of the critiques I have also of seeing work in the last few years is that it's very easy for you to think about a thesis as a project, designing a project. And I would try and uh, jolt you out of that thinking to think about a thesis is a step towards understanding something larger. At the end of the spring semester, hopefully what you'll have is less a project and more a, a record of thinking about buildings as part of the context in, in which they exist. Excellent. Uh, Ignacio. Sure. Thank you very much, Robert. So thank you for all of you. And so I'm Ignacio Cardona. I am, I am the professor with this thick accent. So if you don't, if you don't understand something that I say, please raise your hand and I can repeat myself with the same thick accent. So, uh, yeah, so first of all, I want to thank Jen, Cortis, and Catherine, and Robert, and I'm missing someone, and, and Linda, thanks, sorry. And we, we, have, we, we have had many meetings talking about this course and it's, it's been really rewarding talking about about theory, the relationship between theory and design. And I really like the framework of the course combining theory and design. And I'm completely sure that it, it will be really reward, rewarding talking with, with, with my students the whole semester. So I think that uh, being in a world with this huge crisis, not only COVID-19, but also issues of inequality, it's a privilege to be here talking about architecture and theory. So thank you for this opportunity to, to all of you. For me, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. So I, I want to share with you an anecdote that I feel that demonstrate that there is a close relationship between theory and design. Because even if I am I, I now I'm talking, I, I working as a researcher in different places, including here. I define myself as, as a practitioner. I am a practitioner in architecture. And w some years ago, around eight years ago, I was, I was designing a community center in that place in, uh, that I have in my background. It's, a, in, it's an informal city called Petare in Caracas. And I was, I was trained as an architect to provide the people some responses, some design responses, some shapes, some ideas, some drawings about how to design, how to reimagine the place. And I, I, when I was working there, I, uh, I was working in a participatory technique project, and I asked the community, what do you think we should do in this environment? And there was one really, clever lady, old lady who lived there. And she told me, what do you think? So you are the architect. You should know what we, sh we should have rather than us. So at that moment, I realized that I had to, to, to synthesize many things about the ecologies of inequalities in, this, in my society in order to give a clear design response. So the community was asking me to have a theoretical framework about this city in order to provide a clear response of, of my design, of the project. So the community was basically saying that I had to combine my ideas with my proposals. And it's not enough to ask people what they want and just give clear responses. So at that moment, I realized that if you don't think about the theoretical body uh, of your project, someone is doing that for you. So if you don't think about the theory behind your design, someone is doing that for you. Probably some, when I say someone, probably it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an official agency, is the, is the um, industry of construction, or is the developer, someone is doing that for you. So you have to think about the theories, the idea behind your project. 
So when I say that I am a, I'm a practitioner, I strongly believe that practice and, and theory are something that comes together. I, I honestly believe that, you know, in, in, in Italy, the word drawing is design. So if, if you want to say in Italian, if from, from an Italian that you want to draw something, they say, I want to design you. Design you means drawing and design at the same time. So in, from the Renaissance till now, they know that when we are drawing, we are designing. That means that we are thinking. So, and all of this comes together. And this is exactly what we are planning to work with you uh, this, this semester, is basically to create a, a methodology, to create a body of theory to understand your own design process. That will help you to, with your thesis project, but, but the most important thing is that will help you to understand what are the ideas behind your idea, your design, your project. That's it, that's all that I have for now, Robert. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ignacio. Thank you, everyone. Um, for the last bit, uh, we're gonna cover a few mechanics, but before we get into the mechanics, I want to say something, I've been asked to say something uh, to clarify uh, here and now for everyone. Um, uh, something about the sketch writing. Oops, okay. Is this sharing? Yes. Are you seeing the sketch writing assignment? Yes. Yes, we do. I'm having a slight malfunction. Um, so it's normal. Um, so we've been, t we've been running this course for over a decade now. And um, one of the things uh, our students have taught us uh, is that um, it can be quite intimidating to deal with readings and books and this writing assignment uh, of a literature review. Um, and so I just want to say, offer a few comments to help reassure everybody that the process of writing is a very direct extension of what we already do as architects. That uh, the writing process is really uh, something that helps us design better. Writing is a method, first and foremost, is a method for figuring things out. So when we write, first and foremost, it doesn't feel like it, right? Because it's structured in the context of big assignments or we have a publication to submit or it's very distracting, these larger frameworks. But to the extent that we benefit from writing at all, to the extent that we enjoy writing, to the extent that writing is an important thing for us to do, the reason is not to communicate. The number one reason to write is to figure things out. And that should sound very familiar to us because when we're walking down the street and we see something that uh, is confusing but important, we pull out our sketchbooks, right? We got it right here. We pull out the sketchbook and we, we use the sketchbook to help us figure things out, right? We are figuring things out using the sketchbook. And if you look in your sketchbook, I bet you're going to see a combination of words and pictures. Uh, we think of sketches as being picture-based, but there's also words there. Why is that? It's because uh, the combination of pictures and words are necessary. The combination of pictures and words are the most powerful, most direct way to figure things out. And so uh, writing is an extension of what we already do. We use writing to figure things out. The other thing uh, is, it, is it makes it faster. Uh, we don't have all day, so we don't, when we draw in our sketchbook, we don't 
we don't do this much anymore. We don't go, we don't get the proportions exactly right. We capture the essence of what's going on as quickly as we can. And we don't write whole paragraphs. We capture the essence in words, in phrases, and in sometimes in sentences. We somehow capture the thought so that uh, our future selves can look back through our sketchbooks. Uh, we can bookmark, the, we can fold over the edge. We can remind our future selves what matters most. What we're doing in this course is a direct extension of what you have already been doing throughout your architectural education. The reason we, we write is to make sense of things and to make sense of things as fast as possible. So when I pick up this book and uh, I need to read this book, uh, friends don't let friends read the whole book. I have to figure things out as fast as I can. So I ask myself, what do I want out of this book? This is a target question. I want the English translation, because my Dutch is not so good, I want the English translation of what in the 1920s this architect uh, had to say about the potential for bamboo in uh, supplying housing in the Dutch East Indies. So I go straight to the part that's going to answer that question for me. Along the way, I see there's something else really interesting. And so I grab that along the way. But I do not, the, I'm not reading a novel on the beach. I don't open the page to page, I don't open the book to page one and start reading and read all the way through. As a matter of fact, ask the people here with advanced degrees uh, if they ever read an entire book during their graduate school years. I suspect the answer is no, because friends don't let re friends read entire books. Instead, you aggressively uh, identify what you want. Remind yourself that you don't have time for this. You've got a design project to do in your other class, right? You've got all these other classes. You don't have time for this. So even in this first reading for next Friday, ask yourself the question and give yourself a brutally honest answer. What do I want out of the Stan Allen reading? Uh, I uh, articulate it as a question, as a target question, and then aggressively go into the Stan Allen reading as if you are a burglar in a wealthy person's house. You, you go in and you trip the alarm. The alarm is calling the police. The police are on the way. You can hear the sirens in the background. You don't have time to read the whole thing. You go in, you grab, you grab the things that you can grab, you stuff it in your pocket through sketch writing, and you get out before the police arrive and they throw you in jail, right? So along the way, you see something really interesting, um, but it, uh, it's in another language. It's about uh, anthropology. Uh, you see a plasma screen. Uh, you see a, a, a 4K uh, screen TV on the wall. You, don't have, you can't carry that down the street. You're going to go to jail. You don't have time to translate it from Japanese. You leave it behind. You grab what you can get. You put it, you stuff it into the sketch writing uh, that in a way that captures the value and the essence, and you get out. So the sketch writing assignment is for you. It's a skill that you will use the rest of your lives. Uh, when your client, your boss, your teammate, gives you a stack of paper that you need to synthesize quickly, you don't have time to read everything in that stack, all those documents. You need to quickly identify what matters most, synthesize it as best you can in words and pictures, and then move on. Because you got, your colleagues are expecting you to show up tomorrow morning in the team meeting and deliver in one minute, the essence of what is what they're going to find useful in that stack of materials that you went through. 
that is the skill that will lead to your promotion, your uh, assuming a leadership position in the profession, whatever profession you go into, whether it's design related or not. These are the skills that are going to make a difference in the challenges of the, of the 21st century. So far from being this esoteric writing thing that you need to do to jump through the hoop to get a master's degree, these are the skills that are going to sustain you uh, through a successful career and a successful engagement with the challenges of the world. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make that clear why we are doing what we are doing in this course. This is boot camp uh, for you to develop the skills that are going to uh, lead you to a powerful and successful career. We're going to rehearse it over and over again every week. Uh, right away at the end of this course, you're gonna realize that you have to do this reading for next Friday. You have to do this sketch writing. You have to answer these five annotation questions. And, oh my God, I've got to do an analysis of a piece of architecture, whatever that means. And when I show up in class a week from today, my classmates are going to expect me to, in one minute, deliver a cogent argument supported by the visual evidence to convince them that this is an important research question for all of us moving forward in the discipline of architecture. And you're gonna get it wrong, and then you're gonna get it wrong again, and you're gonna keep getting it wrong over and over again, but each time you get it wrong, it's gonna be slightly less wrong. And before you know it, no one's gonna notice that there's anything wrong, and they're gonna say, wow, that was convincing. We gotta pay attention to what David just said, and okay, off we go. This is the path to leadership. So that's a quick pep talk on what is the purpose of these assignments? Uh, why are we doing what we're doing? What is at stake? What is in it for you? What is in it for the world? Um, Do any of my colleagues want to fill in any holes that I might have left out? Yeah, I was gonna um, just add that if um, you all should have a copy of the annotated bibliography assignment and on the second page of that, we've actually laid out like a series of steps that we suggest, like we suggest you start with the book jacket. Then we suggest you look at the first paragraph of the preface, you know, there's actually Thank you for pulling, yeah. There's actually um, like, these are suggested ways to get in and get out as Robert is saying, so that you're not, we, we really do not expect you guys to be reading books cover to cover for this, so for your thesis, but there are ways to gather the necessary information and the most important points. Um, I think it's up a little bit, right there, yeah. So um, look through those steps and, you know, consider how you can go through this process without having to read the entire text, because it's true, I can tell you that, you know, I did a PhD and there were many times we were supposed to read a book for class. You didn't read every single page of the book because you'd have to do three of those a week. So there was no way to do it. So you have to kind of find ways to understand the author's main ideas without spending hours and hours doing all of this reading. So I just wanted to, um, to pull up that list because I think that that list might be quite helpful for you guys. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Well, I, I guess I would just say that um, the, the notion that there's a right and wrong answer or attitude or um, thinking to pull out of either the readings that are assigned or readings that you actually do is not at all interesting to me. It, what's interesting to me is, is that you take a position and have a, a way of supporting that position, whether, whether your classmates agree or not. And it may be more interesting to take a position just to uh, I'm going to say start a discussion or provoke a little bit of argument 
so that we get people out of entrenched ideas about what is the thing that you're supposed to get out of out of this reading. Um, we were doing our intros a little bit a little time ago, and I wanted to add that uh, one of the experiences I had over the last week was an argument with with somebody that said to me, "Why can't we have beautiful buildings?" And it devolved into this discussion of uh, what beautiful was, and this individual was staking out territory who and it, a position that said there isn't a, a description of beautiful. There is an absolute agreement about beautiful. And I said, no way. So uh, I would if, um, ask you to look at the, what you pull out of these readings and your sketch writing as not necessarily an absolute position, but a, a position to um, bring to the seminar discussion as provoking discussion, as opposed to just agreeing with maybe what your buddy and the person that you're working with during the semester happens to think. So hopefully these um, uh, quick reads will get you to think, well, I don't agree with this at all, or I just read something that uh, contradicts this, this author. So that's what I want to bring to the discussion. Even though you have an assignment that says, here are the things you're supposed to do, I hope you'll stand back and say, um, yeah, so I did all of that. And I walked away with a completely different point of view from my buddy, the, the person that I'm working with this semester. And that's more valuable than walking away with, oh, I agree with this author's point of view. I read his uh, uh, introduction and um, my quick read of this is uh, something that completely obviates his evidence and I'm willing to bring that to the seminar discussion. Awesome. I would also chime in just to say that um, Robert and all of us, I think, try to create a condition in which what Robert is saying is actually possible to be enacted. So you can treat us the same way that Robert is recommending you treat the books. Um, your minds wander, that's fine. Um, you're discovering things even as you listen to us. If you're not paying attention to the words, we don't expect you to remember everything we say. And I don't think we even remember everything we say. <laughs> but that's part of this process of discovery, and um, it leads to new insights. So good luck with that. Anybody else? Yeah, I want to uh, just add one thing to um, maybe recommend everybody to be open to abandon preconception. So what I was trying to say with my um, latest research about fake architecture was that I was completely convinced I knew exactly what it was. I know what a fake granite countertop looks like. I know what fake siding looks like. I know what even sort of, you know, fake places like Disneyland or what I thought they were looked like. And throughout the years, uh, the two or three years I worked on it, turned out all my preconceptions were very weak and superficial and, and pretty wrong, depending on who the user was and what type of experience people had. So one recommendation is to really be open to have a, take a stand, but also be willing to absorb a new direction and be willing to let go of the preconceptions that might have been laid through previous studios or previous experiences and just open up to a new interpretation of the topic in question. And it might be worth mentioning that um, this course is the cumulative outcome. The current version of the course is basically the product of uh, every, every few weeks <laughs> we, we talk about, we sit down and we talk a lot for the past 12 years. Um, what was the best thing that you got out of your graduate experience? And what do you wish you had learned in your methods course in your graduate program? And so um, we have uh, graduates of some of the best graduate schools in the world uh, complaining bitterly about what was not included in their graduate methods course and so this is our response. This is our revenge against the weaknesses 
and the failures of uh, the methods courses we took when we went to graduate school. And it keeps changing every year because you guys at the end of the course are going to give us some frank and honest uh, suggestions on what worked and didn't work so that we can improve the course uh, some more. Um, so now I'm going to quickly cover some logistics. Um, uh, first and foremost, Blackboard. Uh, you're familiar with Blackboard uh, with all its strengths and weaknesses. Um, uh, its limitations ha have required us to kind of strip it down to a, a generic infrastructure that basically is hosting uh, the announcements, it's hosting the syllabus, it's hosting the assignments of the literature review, it is hosting, it is a platform that can link you to a whole bunch of useful uh, links um, to guidance on how to use uh, footnotes and uh, bibliography. And, um, and it is also the infrastructure that we are using uh, to manage your assignment submissions. So every week uh, before the Friday seminar, um, you are submitting your work through Blackboard, you are getting feedback through the infrastructure of Blackboard uh, the way you are used to. Um, but one thing we've changed this year is that it, uh, it doesn't say project to practice, it doesn't give you themes uh, every week because we don't want to lock uh, each of the sections into a specific set of themes and writings. So instead, uh, we go to um, uh, the Google Sites, um, the course website. And this is a larger website that was set up years ago for the thesis studio. And then a few years after that, we started using it for the methods course. And this year, we're going to make a great deal of use to it, uh, of it. Um, and so, um, if someone uh, could drop this uh, link into the chat, Jennifer, maybe, um, that would be great. So that you should all navigate to this site uh, and check it out, explore it. What you will find when you arrive is you'll find the syllabus. Um, you will find um, a set of readings that were set up. Uh, a, a folder full of readings. And then you will find uh, six uh, sub pages which correspond with uh, the six sections. And you will see uh, links to Zoom, links to Blackboard, links to a tool where, uh, that is Concept Board that uh, uh, your, your section instructor will, um, will, will review with you at some point this week or next. Um, and you will also see a set of readings um, that these are the default readings that in, a, in previous years we would have said here are the eight topics, here are the readings for the topics, they're listed in the syllabus, but in the syllabus there's also a bunch of alternative readings for each topic um, that uh, you will notice are that your, your group, your classmates, your instructor um, might uh, decide instead of uh, on race, space, and architecture, instead of reading the Reinhold Martin reading, uh, maybe it's the Mabel O. Wilson reading, maybe it's the Diane Harris reading. Um, uh, it may be changed. Those changes will be reflected uh, in the uh, individual pages uh, of the uh, under the name of your section instructor. So that's the way we are using uh, this website. It is basically the location for the topics and readings uh, that, that you will be working with in the week by week seminar. You can also uh, see examples of successful 
prior versions of the assignments, um, bearing in mind um, that uh, two years ago, the annotated bibli bibliography assignment was somewhat different than it is this year. Uh, and it's changed even from last year. So these examples uh, should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, this, is a play, this is a repository, a collection for um, examples uh, of projects that you may wish to discuss with your instructors in section. Um, <clears throat> if you, uh, one other thing we're introducing for the first time this year is we are requiring every student uh, between now and midterm grades of the semester of the semester to engage with uh, the excellent writing coaches at the Center for Academic Excellence. Um, and that is uh, described in page, on page five of the syllabus that uh, we want you to use uh, the weekly seminar assignment where you are writing a six sentence, one minute argument based on the outcome of your graphic analysis. That is a piece of very uh, constrained formal writing that makes it extremely useful as an exercise uh, in learning how to write effectively, where every paragraph has a purpose. Every sentence in that paragraph uh, supports the larger purpose of the paragraph. And right down to the structure of the sentence and the choice of words, especially the verb. What verb are you going to put in the sentence to support what this sentence needs to do, to support what the paragraph needs to do, to support what your literature review needs to do. Uh, and this is something that is going to be an intense focus of uh, especially the second half of every class meeting every Friday. Uh, and we want you to take full advantage of the excellent resources and support that are available to all of us at the Center for Academic Excellence. And with that, I think I've exhausted not just all of you, but my list of uh, tasks uh, to cover. I would encourage all of you to ask questions. Uh, we're going to now move to, um, we're gonna shortly move to individual Zoom rooms. Uh, after I would suggest a short break. But before we do that, uh, does anyone have something to say or a question that would be useful uh, to address in this forum with all 73 uh, participants in the course? I would, Robert. I uh, just would ask you to address the two sessions that we are going to be having uh, with the, the studio course. The, uh, I think it's the 29th of September and the 13th of November, we will officially be meeting with your other uh, studio course, your other instructors that we're paired with. So maybe you want to say a couple words about that. Jennifer, can you speak to that? I think uh, one of them is locked in and the other is optional. No, uh, they're so the 29th um, of September is a Tuesday. So we will be joining the design as research class that day on Tuesday. Um, and that'll be great. We'll get to talk to you all together uh, in our individual sections. Um, the other one is, I believe it's November 13th, which is a Friday. So the design as research, a design as research instructors will be joining our class for our, probably for the second half, um, but for our Friday session, and Robert, what you're thinking of, there was one other optional thing, okay. um, but I, I would have to look at what that was. Um, but I know that the 29th of September and the 13th of November are joint sessions with the two instructors. And don't be surprised if uh, some of us show up as guest critics in Design as Research or your studio course. Anything else? OK, 
hearing nothing. Um, let's take a five minute break and then uh, I'll meet up uh, in their individual sections. And where's the Zoom link for our individual sections? It's in the syllabus at the top. Um, so take your pick of how to navigate to your syllabus. It is also uh, in the uh, method site under each section. There is a Zoom link at the top of each section, I believe. Um, and if you're confused about anything, uh, stay on the call. Uh, otherwise, um, you can leave the meeting and um, have a great semester, everybody. <laughs>